Okay. Yeah. Remember the minor prophets, uh, part of the Nivaim, the prophets uh, uh, located at uh, the back of our New Testament, but always relating uh, to the law of the Torah in some way. As we read uh, the prophets, of course, let's remember to look for images, and, and we're going to see them in uh, in Micah. It just seems like everyone is filled with some uh, great poetic image, and it just shouldn't be, be lost on us when we see uh, these uh, poetic uh, images in front of us. They, they have something to tell us. Uh, we could, um, well, we'll, we'll work with, with one of the images today of, uh, of the mountains melting like wax. Uh, that's quite an image. Um, uh, we would generally think of uh, God and his judgment uh, in other ways, and we could write it out uh, uh, descriptively, but uh, poetically. Uh, we think of mountains uh, melting like wax. It, it does add uh, something else uh, uh, to it. Lots of correspondences, of course, with uh, the law and correspondences with the New Testament. You'll see that today, even in a book like Micah. They're not frequently uh, considered, uh, but with many poetic gems, and they do uh, have some powerful words for us today. Prophecy is like a mountain range, and uh, I know uh, David's been out there in the, the mountains of Kansas. <laughs> Are, are, are there any mountains there in Kansas at all, David? There are Flint Hills, uh, but they uh, are just hills, and 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 that's a stretch. <laughs> when you say a hill, I mean, what type of hill do you mean? I mean, does, is there uh, an incline or? Uh... The, 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 there is, uh, if you stand, uh, um, quite not quite as tall as a basketball goal. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That was the Netherlands. It was flat. Uh, it made uh, New Jersey look like uh, the Rocky Mountain state. It was <laughs> flat and, uh, as it was. Um, but prophecy, I've heard, maybe you've heard this too, David, uh, prophecy being considered like a mountain range. And if you've been maybe to the next state over from Kansas, that is, we go west in Colorado, which my guess is you've been, haven't you, David? Mm, yeah, I have a sister there, yeah. Huh, okay. where, where is she? Littleton. Oh, yeah. Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah well, her, that's right her, up, uh, next to him. Yeah, her oh. her backyard uh, um, looked out over what they call the hog's back. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Anybody been to Estes Park in Colorado? Mm -hmm. Jeff? Yeah. I've been there, man. Bill? Well, the only time I've been in uh, Colorado was uh, crossed over at Stapleton Airport. <laughs> mm. Mm hmm. David, you've been to Estes Park? Uh, it's been many, many years ago, but it, it's gorgeous. It is gorgeous. And I, I remember uh, uh, talking with uh, a, a Christian uh, professor uh, in Colorado uh, and him likening the prophets to a mountain range. And I, as I was hiking in Estes Park afterwards, I thought, you know, this is actually a pretty good uh, uh, analogy. As you look out at the range, you can't see what's first or what's last. And even as you uh, enter into the range, uh, you're not exactly sure um, uh, how events uh, look uh, forward or, or backwards. So, although as you trace your steps, uh, if you were maybe writing a diary, you could tell, tell which mountain comes first, which one's next, and which uh, follows after. I think that's actually a help as we look at uh, the prophets, um, especially today in Micah, we're going to see uh, uh, catastrophic judgment, and, and there was judgment, but uh, not as catastrophic as it could be. Um, uh, we're going to see uh, the prophecy of uh, the Messiah uh, as part of this um, uh, prophecy. Uh, we'll see something about a remnant and how God's calling his people uh, together. Uh, but as you look at it from Micah's perspective, it just looks like one big mountain range. Uh, you know, which is first, which is last? I'm not sure. Oh, but we're in a time of social injustice in 2020, and you've already seen some of the damage. Uh, you've seen some of the finger pointing that's happening, and there's ongoing discussion about uh, equality of races. Um, uh, and I think Micah has something uh, to say. So as we look at a minor prophet, we'll look at it as we have beforehand. We're going to try and find a little bit of background, trying to place uh, each uh, minor prophet in relation to uh, the kings. 
And then um, also we'll try and uh, uh, look at the date um, and before looking at uh, the prophet uh, in particular. So who is this man, Micah? Hmm. Anybody know somebody named Micah? <laughs> Nate's college roommate. <laughs> okay. Did he, he ever uh, talk to his roommate about why he was named Micah? Is it a family name? I, I, good question. I do not know. Bill, you know anybody named Micah? So the only thing I was trying, I was trying to think, uh, one of the characters in the old TV show, The Rifleman, was Micah. I think it was the sheriff. Okay. But that's the only Micah that I know. Okay. Okay. Somebody's been watching too much TV. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff, anybody? No Micahs. No Micahs. No. I knew uh, uh, somebody who named their child Micah. And I never asked why, but uh, it's the only Micah I've run across. But it means, who is like the Lord? Hmm. Prophet Micah, uh, he was someone who prophesied under two good kings, Jotham and Hezekiah, and then one bad king named Ahaz. Uh, so his uh, prophecy uh, has a range here. He's a contemporary of the prophet Isaiah, and he prophesies between 740 and 700 BC. The meaning of his, uh, of his name, who is like the Lord? Hmm, indeed, who is like the Lord? Uh, that's, uh, that's a good name uh, to have. And Micah will then prophesy of who the Lord is and then also uh, how one ought to react to the Lord. <laughs> Let's look at a couple of the kings, though, under whom he is prophesying. First one, King Jotham. Anybody know a Jotham? I don't know a Jotham. Uh, David? No. Nate have a roommate named uh, Jotham? <laughs> <laughs> Double name Jotham, Micah Jotham. Mike, Micah Jotham, there we go. <laughs> okay. Well, here's a little section about uh, Jotham. Um, in the second year of Pekah, the son of Remaliah, king of Israel, Jotham, the son of Uzziah, king of Judah, began to reign. He was 25 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 16 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Jerusha, the, son, the daughter of Zadok. I want to ask you if you know anybody that knows, has those names. And he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, according to all his father Uzziah had done. Okay, so good start, but then not so good. Nevertheless, the high places were not removed. Um, this is the places where, uh, on the mountains, where they, they might have uh, uh, sacrifices uh, or worship of other gods. The people still sacrificed and made offerings on the high places, but Jotham built the upper gate of the house of the Lord. Now the rest of the acts of Jotham and all that he did, are they not written in the book of Chronicles of the kings of Judah? In those days, the Lord began to send Rezin, the king of Syria, and Pekah, the son of Remaliah, against Judah. And then Jot Jotham slept with his fathers and was buried with his fathers in the city of David, his father, and he has his son reigned in his place. Okay, any comment about Jotham? appears to be faithful to an extent faithful to an extent yeah sort of half and half i probably should have said he's uh yeah uh, he's sort of a mid place between hezekiah and then uh, ahaz you know, when you look at the point about not removing the things in the high places i don't know whether it was just him or it seemed to be a habit or you see several different uh books in the uh, old testament where it's like they didn't go all the way. And I don't know whether that's because the upper places were more the rural area away from the urban. And so they couldn't sort of, you know, overcome some of the, uh, we want to call it the rural um, pagans type of thing or what. But that seems to be a habit. They don't want to take the, uh, take the things down. Yeah. Yeah. For one reason or another. Yeah. Going from Jotham, let's go on to Ahaz. Not a good king. Second Kings chapter 16, verses 1 through 3. In the 17th year of Pekah, the son of Remaliah, Ahaz, the son of Jotham, king of Judah, began to reign. Ahaz was 20 years old when he began to reign. It's amazing to think of these kings reigning at 20 years of age. Uh, uh, some of us with children 20 years old, I just couldn't imagine them uh, <laughs> looking after a country. 
uh, during a time like that. Well, Ahaz reigns 30, 16 years in Jerusalem, and this is his short epitaph, and he did not do what was right in the eyes of the Lord his God, as his father David had done. But he walked in the way of the kings of Israel. He even burned his son as an offering. Wow. According to the despicable practices of the nations whom the Lord drove out before the people of Israel. That's a short epitaph, but uh, I wouldn't want to have that uh, written about, about me. Uh, all that we remember, hmm, he didn't do well. And the, oh, the one thing he did do is uh, he burned his son as an offering. Wow. Mm. But then we have Hezekiah, who is definitely a good king. Now, I don't know anybody named Hezekiah, uh, but of, of the kings, Hezekiah is a pretty good guy. So anybody know a Hezekiah? I don't know why people haven't named their, their children Hezekiah. It's a, he's a good guy. Uh, but mm -hmm. Anyway, so we're reading about him. In the third year of Hosea, son of Elah, king of Israel, Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz, king of Judah, began to reign. I, I think it's also interesting that as bad as Ahaz was, Hezekiah is just the, the opposite. Um, he was 25 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 29 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Abi, the daughter of Zechariah. And he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, according to all that David, his father, had done. So it's like a polar opposite. He removed the high places and broke the pillars and cut down the Asherah, Asherah being a um, uh, deity, um, uh, Phoenician uh, deity. And he broke in pieces the bronze serpent that Moses had made, for until those days the people of Israel had made offerings to it. It was called Nehushtan. He trusted in the Lord, the God of Israel, so that there was none like him among all the kings of Judah after him, nor among those who were before him. So he's a really good guy. We ought to name our kids to Hezekiah. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> For he held fast to the Lord. He did not depart from following him, but kept the commandments that the Lord commanded Moses. And the Lord was with him. Wherever he went out, he prospered. He rebelled against the king of Israel and uh, king of Assyria, and would not serve him. Well, it's it's obvious that just like we choose our presidents, and sometimes, you know, who we vote for and who they end up being is, you know, and these people didn't vote, but you know, leaders are all over the place. There's good there's good leaders and bad leaders, and. Um, you know, as as the leader is, so so the people go. The other thing I think is interesting here, uh, and it goes to the, the problems that the uh, Jews had all, the fact that they were making uh, offerings to the uh, bronze serpent that Moses made. Yep. I mean, it's like, again, it's like they didn't learn. Okay. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, and of course, that we can put that for what it's like today as well because we don't learn either. But mm -hmm. uh, it's still that, it shows that all that time there's that undercurrent of uh, um, paganism or ungodliness that was a, a strong undercurrent. So it's not surprising that you had the, uh, well, it's not so much an ebb and flow, it seemed to be more of a flow of the evil kings, but, uh, you know, it, it was problems throughout the uh, the nation. Yep. Yeah. When you even worship the bronze serpent that was supposed to be a, a help for finding uh, finding the way, uh, you know, there's definitely some confusion that's that's happened there. So why don't we read a little bit of Micah, and we'll start with uh, some pretty bleak news because the first few chapters are they're they're pretty harsh. Um, but we won't stay in it for long. Uh, but since uh, uh, the Lord does judge uh, and is the judge of all, um, we need to read these uh, from time to time. So here goes. Micah 1, uh, 1 and 2. The word of the Lord that came to Micah of Moresheth in the days of Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, which he saw concerning Samaria and Jerusalem. Hear you peoples, all of you, pay attention, O earth, and all that is in it, and let the Lord God be a witness against you, the Lord from his holy temple. Okay, so it's not a good start here. Not a witness for you, but a witness against you, the Lord from his holy temple, the place of uh, all perfection. For behold, the Lord is coming 
out of his place and will come down and tread upon the high places of the earth. Uh, remember, we had uh, already uh, talked about high places that hadn't been worn, uh, been taken out. So now the Lord is going to tread upon the high places and the mountains will melt under him and the valleys will split open like wax before the fire. The waters pour down a steep place. What an image. I know this is harder for you, David, being from Kansas, uh, but... <laughs> Try, try and think of it like Colorado here. I mean, I, I just couldn't imagine this. Uh, um, uh, we, uh, as we were clearing out to my uh, parents' place, we came across a number of candles, and I was reminiscing on the number of times uh, we would sit outside on the porch at night and have a candle and watching uh, the, the candle melt and sometimes uh, running over from uh, uh, the candle onto the table. Um, but that's a candle, and we could control it, but to think about a large mountain like Pike's Peak melting like wax. I mean, wow, what, what an image. Any thoughts on this? Well, other, other places in scripture um, seem to, to speak of this, uh, like uh, Psalm 46. Yep. Um, yep. Psalm 46, uh, I think Isaiah has, uh, has this as well. Uh, it's a common... Um, it's a common image, and it's really, I find it rather terrifying. Yeah, it, it is. And, um, you know, Jesus talked about, you know, if you pray, you know, say to this mountain, it will yes. be moved. Yes. Um, and, uh, and also, uh, in the end times, uh, there will be those that will wish the mountains would fall on them. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Well, this is quite a uh, quite a um, alarming image here. Thinking of the Lord coming out, uh, treading on the high places, and then mountains melting and valleys being split open. Um, quite a quite a scene. We keep reading. All this is for the transgression of Jacob and for the sins of the house of Israel transgression and sin uh, uh, being the reason for this. What is the transgression of Jacob? Is it not Samaria? And what is the high place of Judah? Is it not Jerusalem? Therefore, I will make Samaria a heap in the open country, a place for planting vineyards, and I will pour down her stones into the valley and cover her foundations. All her carved images shall be beaten to pieces. All her wages shall uh, shall be burned with fire, and all her idols I will lay waste. For from the fee of a prostitute she gathered them, and to the fee of a prostitute they shall return. For this I will lament and wail. I will go stripped and naked. I will make lamentation like the jackals, and mourning like the ostriches. For her wound is incurable, and it has come to Judah. It has reached to the gate of my people to Jerusalem. Wow. Here I have a picture of uh, one of the Phoenician uh, deities with, uh, uh, with a child being uh, sacrificed uh, uh, to it. Uh, uh, an evil thing, um, uh, these carved images um, that uh, were worshipped and unfortunately had made its way into, uh, into Israel. And the Lord's going to say, there's going to be a point in time. I'm not going to put up with it. Come on, our thought on uh, Micah chapter 1. It's definitely not an encouraging time. Okay. <laughs> well, it's not. Lamentation like the jackals and mourning like the ostriches. Um, you know, if you've been in desert climates and have uh, heard the jackals uh, 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 moaning and wailing, uh, no, it is, it is not a happy image. I'm, I'm wondering what, what years Micah, Micah's ministry is. Yeah, I have it 700... Um, uh, seven, 700, uh, 740 to 700 is what I had it. Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the Northern Kingdom has been, uh, um, or is its doom has either just happened or is impending. Right. So, yeah. Right. Yeah. So it, this might be written right before the exile takes takes place. More happy news. Micah chapter 2. <laughs> Bear with me here. It'll turn happier in a moment. Uh, Woe to those who devise wickedness and work evil on their beds. Wow. When the morning dawns, they perform it be because it is in the power of their hand. 
They covet fields and seize them, and houses and take them away. They oppress a man in his house, a man in his inheritance. Therefore, thus says the Lord, Behold, against this family I am devising disaster, from which you cannot remove your necks, and you shall not walk haughtily, for it will be a time of disaster. Uh, I was just thinking about this, uh, working evil on their beds. Um, like you've been pondering it in the middle of the night. Um, I don't know if you deal with, any of you deal with uh, insomnia. Um, I deal with it a little bit. Uh, uh, sometimes it can be a really good prayer time, uh, but I'm just thinking about this image about uh, being awake at night and actually devising uh, Ill, uh, wickedness uh, and uh, planning it. Uh, and then when the dawn comes, uh, carrying it out because you have the ability uh, to do so. Um, um, my guess is you can think of uh, some people throughout history uh, who have done this, um, uh, uh, like the Nazis and how they planned out uh, the final solution, uh, thinking it through and uh, uh, making uh, um, horrendous uh, um, and awful plans to uh, wipe out uh, uh, people like the Jews and others that they didn't uh, like. But that's uh, some of uh, uh, the image uh, I think that uh, Micah picks up here people who plotted it and thought about it from the middle of the night and then going to uh, uh, take it out on uh, unsuspecting ones. Any comments on these uh, verses? Seeing that mentioned in there where it talks about coveting the fields, it makes me think uh, uh, how contemporary we see it with the death of the uh, pastor and his wife in the fields in Nigeria. Yes where it was plotted and it was a fight over the land. I mean, it's 2000 plus years later and it's still happening. Yes. Just a few more depressing verses and then I'll change it around here. Micah two verses four and five in that day, they shall take up a taunt song against you and moan bitterly and say, we are utterly ruined. He changes the portion of my people, how he removes it from me to an apostate. He allots our fields. Therefore, therefore, you will have none to cast the line by lot in the assembly of the Lord. Okay, a big woe section here from the beginning of uh, Micah. Anytime you, you read woe in um, uh, the scriptures, it is bad news. It's not like, woe, horse, uh, stop, but uh, woe, uh, uh, this is a, a, a disaster. Um, do not want the Lord saying woe to you. But thankfully... There's a promise, and even in judgment, uh, there is promise, uh, and even in woe, if one finds the right way, uh, there is uh, uh, hope, and we find it right at the end of Micah chapter 2. I'm saving you some of the other verses that are also bleak in Micah 2 as we turn now to a few promises. I will surely assemble all of you, O Jacob. I will gather the remnant of Israel. I will set them together like sheep in a fold, like a flock in its pasture a noisy multitude of men. He who opens the breach goes up before them. They, they break through and pass the gate, going out by it. Their king passes on before them, the Lord at their head. So you're a promise of the Lord bringing people back uh, together again as he will uh, look after his own. Micah 3, 1, and, uh, 1 through 4, um, but it's still in midst in, uh, encased in this time of judgment where we read further. And I said, hear you heads of Jacob and rulers of the house of Israel. Is it not for you to know justice? You who hate the good and love the evil, who tear the skin off from my people and their flesh from off their bones, who eat the flesh of my people and flay their skin from, the, uh, from off them and break their bones in pieces and chop them up like meat in a pot, like flesh in a cauldron. Then they will cry to the Lord, and I, this I find is, is most uh, uh, striking here. But he will not answer them. Wow. Uh, he will hide his face from them at that time because they have made their deeds evil. That last verse, I think, is perhaps most troubling of all. Um, we, we always talk about second chances uh, and uh, times for people to repent and turn to the Lord. But uh, it seems from Micah that there's a, a point in time when it gets so, so terribly bad that even that uh, uh, cannot happen. Um, I find that very terrifying, perhaps the most terrifying uh, verse uh, that we've read so far. Anybody comment or thought? Hey, this is more 
don't necessarily say it's poetic, but it's definitely a vivid imagery here. Any thoughts on this, David? As someone who, you know, unfortunately, needs to carry the message of judgment sometimes, as we do as pastors. Well, uh, I would say that uh, the Lord carries a. You know, I think as a pastor, we're always uh, trying to temper things, yeah. and we don't want to. We, we we think of okay, how is this going to be heard, and who's going to be hurt by it, and who's going to uh, what are the reactions going to be? And and here, the Bible, I mean, this passage just lays waste. It, <laughs> it pulls no punch, punches. And, um, you know, that I, I can appreciate the prophets. Uh, you know, I, 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 on the one hand, I find myself, I don't want to necessarily emulate them. Um, but, but they're, they're, because their message is, is unique and uh, and special, um, but the the, the Bible is uh, a blatantly harsh and honest book. Yep. Because yep. sin is is harsh. Yeah, and then this verse here in Micah three four about sin becoming so, I guess, reaching the point where there there is no way that these folks will will turn around. Mm. Um, you know, going back to the uh, the Nazis and the uh, the Final Solution. I mean, there were there were just some some flat out evil evil things uh, that happened uh, uh, with uh, uh, with the Final Solution. Um, mm. uh, some of you might might know that the very first uh, uh, gassing of uh, of uh, of the Jews in Auschwitz uh, took place on Christmas Day. Um, wow, I mean, I mean, how how evil can you be? Um, uh, a supposedly uh, Christian-backed uh, nation, at least uh, as Hitler tried to uh, uh, try and uh, pull some of these uh, principles uh, for uh, uh, his uh, um, favored race uh, from a, a Christian um, thoughts in some ways. But now you're going to. Ex uh, not only rise up against those that you hate, but you're going to exterminate them on uh, on Christmas Day. It's, it's uh, unbelievable how hard have hearts uh, become. Well, just summarizing here, at least uh, in um, in Micah, uh, there is a judgment, and God's judgment is coming. Idolatry is an issue, and uh, when one is uh, planning. Uh, uh, and sacrificing one's, uh, one's children, idolatry is definitely an issue uh, at the time. Planning evil, also an issue in, in uh, Micah's time. Continuous hardness uh, is, we see, is a very great problem so that the Lord won't uh, hear when people turn. That's, that's a real problem. And then we see social injustice uh, is an issue as well. Thankfully, there is hope even when judgment is talked about. And Mike has got a lot of hope um, in it. We've read some of the bleak parts, but now let's read some of the more promising parts, which also have a parallel to other sections of scripture. Micah 4, verses 1 and 2. It shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord, uh, the house of the Lord, shall be established as the highest of the mountains, and it shall be lifted up above the hills, and people shall flow to it. And many nations shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways, and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord, of the Lord from Jerusalem. Anybody recognize a parallel to another section of scripture? Parallel to Isaiah chapter 2, where it almost seems as if uh, something very similar is talked about. Uh, Behold the mountain, the mountain of the Lord, uh, and the law going forth uh, from the mountain of the Lord, uh, so that people might walk uh, in his ways. And this prophecy, uh, which sounds once again like Isaiah, he shall judge between many peoples and shall decide disputes for strong nations far away. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Have you, I'm sure you've heard of that. Bill, you heard of that uh, quote before? 
for the pl- short swords and the plowshares. Yeah. That was, yeah. And that was also one of the themes of the peaceful use of the atom in the, uh, in the 50s after the uh, devastation in Nagasaki and Hiroshima. Mm-hmm. They were, and it might even show somewhere on the uh, UN somewhere. Anybody recognize where the, the statue's from? Mm. Is that in Russia? No, actually, that's uh, New York City. Really? It's, uh, right outside the United Nations. Uh, we're the same uh, a vision, ironically, uh, uh, taken from the scripture. Um, not really from Micah, probably from Isaiah, because this is a parallel to Isaiah, but uh, the man is uh, turning his uh, sword uh, into a plowshare. Oh. Huh. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they, they learn war any more. But they shall sit every man under his vine and under his fig tree, and no one shall make them afraid. Hmm. I might like to have a fig tree. Uh, <laughs> vine too, all right. Yeah, for the Lord, mouth of the Lord has spoken. For all the peoples walk each in the name of its God, but we will walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. What a great prophecy. Here in this, uh, just following all this uh, uh, bleakness uh, and judgment, uh, that uh, there is a hope. There is a, a mountain, uh, a prophetic mountain, uh, uh, that will come where indeed the house of the Lord uh, will be and where there will be peace forever. In that day, declares the Lord, I will assemble the lame and gather those who have been driven away and those whom I have afflicted. And the lame I will make the remnant and those who are cast off a strong nation. And the Lord will reign over them in Mount Zion from this time forth and forevermore. What a great prophecy, a great encouragement. I think it's interesting that the the prophet talks about assembling the lame. I mean, how difficult would that be? Um, and if you assemble the blind, uh, you know, they could all be standing up and you can sort of guide them, uh, pushing them along with, uh, by their shoulder and you can put them all together. Um, the deaf, uh, you can point and they could form a group, but the lame, you have to pick them up, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> to, to assemble them, uh, to bring them together, to gather them. Um, but that's the implication here, or that's, that's the prophecy here. That uh, those who have been lame uh, for various reasons, uh, sin uh, or uh, illness or uh, a whole bunch of uh, reasons, will now be brought together as the Lord himself will bring them together as a remnant. And that word remnant is used uh, several times uh, within Micah. There's always, always a remnant. There's always uh, a group that will be faithful uh, to the Lord. Commander, a thought on uh, uh, this uh, encouraging passage from Micah 4? Well, it, it reminds me of, um, you know, the, the last will be first and the first last. Okay. Uh, that, that, that human ability has nothing to do with, um, you know, the Lord's choosing or honoring. Yep. And if you're lame. And the, and the lame, uh, you know, in, in, in Jewish culture, you know, the lame... You know, we're oftentimes um, left to beg, yeah. and so they uh, they were, you know, looked down upon. Uh, if you read, uh, you know, uh, other places, you know, uh, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he should be born blind? Yep. Um, and here, you know, the Lord chooses the lame. He, yes. He, uh, Yes, he chooses the lame and chooses the lame to be the remnant. Uh, it's, yeah. it's amazing. It's amazing. Uh, yeah. It also yeah. makes you, in a way, think to the, by the, the pool about the man who, uh, who uh, was lame or crippled and he could never get into the pool in time. And yeah. yet he had the faithfulness that even though all that period of time, he still believed that he could be cured. And, uh, so sometimes it's the, the faithfulness of the, of the ones who are not um, the strongest. Yes. Yeah. A little more Micah now. Micah chapter 5, uh, which builds off, uh, it seems, uh, of Micah 4. Now muster your troops, O daughter of troops. Siege is laid against us. With a the rod they strike the judge of Israel on the cheek. 
But you, O Bethlehem, Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah. Oh, I've heard this before. From you shall come forth for me. One who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient days. Oh, I think we all recognize that. How many times you preached off of that one, uh, David? <laughs> Not very many. <laughs> Well, yeah, but it uh, shows up there in uh, in the Gospel, um, uh, Gospel of Matthew, and uh, you know here it, it's uh, encased uh, amidst um, uh, this prophetic mountain range that Micah gives us of uh, great judgment um, and bleakness uh, because of uh, idolatry and continued hardness of heart. Uh, the promise of the mountain of the Lord being established, and here we have the Messiah uh, and his birth, uh, birthplace, uh, uh, also part of this mountain range. Reading a little bit further in Matthew 5, Therefore he shall give them up until the time when she who is in labor has given birth. Then the rest of his brothers shall return to the people of Israel, and he shall stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they shall dwell secure, for now he shall be great to the ends of the earth, and he shall be their peace. Think of uh, the Messiah and how he will be the great shepherd. And we'll have a message on that. How many weeks from now, David? About three or four weeks? I'm the great shepherd. Yeah, it's a, I believe it's, so. Fits in line with uh, Micah or uh, Ezekiel, uh, but it's a prophetic image um, uh, with the Messiah. Finishing up Micah 5, then the remnant of Jacob shall be in the midst of many peoples, like dew from the Lord, like showers on the grass, which delay not for a man, nor wait for the children of man. And the remnant of Jacob shall be among the, the nations, in the midst of many peoples, like a lion among the beasts of the forest, like a young lion among the flocks of sheep, which when it goes through, treads down and tears in pieces, and there is none to deliver. Your hand shall be lifted up over your adversaries, and all your enemies shall be cut off. All right, which we see uh, uh, now at, um, uh, as uh, God's people living in the midst of many other peoples, uh, like a remnant. Um, nice parallel here to uh, Psalm uh, uh, 23. Uh, Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup overflows. Uh, uh, thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies, uh, particularly that. Uh, the idea of the, the sheep being amidst the enemies. Uh, here, the remnant being in the midst of many other peoples. Yet the Lord uh, uh, providing uh, dew, uh, showers, uh, uh, and um, a means for uh, his flock uh, to still uh, find nourishment. Let's go on to Michael's, Micah chapter 6, where we find some practical guidance. Uh, is when you're in a mountain range of uh, prophecies, you might be saying, well, which comes first? Which comes last? Uh, where are we now? Well, Micah actually answers some of that for us in Micah chapter 6, where he's uh, uh, speaking very um, pertinently, pertinently to the present uh, circumstance of his hearers. Arise, plead your case before the mountains, and let the hills hear your voice. Hear you mountains, the indictment of the Lord. Right? They're not melting like wax now, but uh, there's prophecy to be like that. And you enduring foundations of the earth, for the Lord has an indictment against his people, and he will contend with Israel. O oh, my people, what have I, to, have I done to you? How have I wearied you? Answer me, for I brought you up from the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of slavery. Hmm, Exodus language here right? And I set before you Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. O oh, my people, remember what Balak, uh, king of Moab, devised, and what Balaam, the son of Beor, answered him, and what happened from Shittim in Gilgal, and you know, and, and that you may know the righteous acts of the Lord. What does the Lord require? Right, where he's now given a, a summary of how the Lord has worked and how he has brought up his people, a history what should we then do? Hmm. Well, should we sacrifice many rams? I like this picture. I thought this was sort of funny. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? 
will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams? That's not a thousand rams there, but you know, you can see a lot of rams. Uh, with ten thousands of rivers of oil. Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? Right? He's building up. What can he do? What should he be doing now? All these sacrifices. And then we have this little gem in Micah 6, 8. He has told you, a man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? But to do justice, to love mercy, or to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. My guess is you all know that verse, but uh, the context, I think, is rather striking. Uh, uh, what do we do? Um, uh, should we do all these sacrifices? No. Act justly. Love mercy. Walk humbly with your God. Comment or thought on this? Well, it, it, um, I, I think it puts in the right position ritual versus transformation. Hmm. which which uh, was also a message of Casper Sh Schwenkfeld. Oh, yes. Um, the sacramentalism of, of the day versus the heart transformation that, that he was about. Uh, the only, only thing I want to talk about when Dave was mentioning uh, Schwenkfeld, when you consider the, uh, the Stillstand, I hmm. mean, that was the, uh, if you want to talk about uh, not dealing with... Uh, ritual and all if you didn't have the pure heart then you shouldn't deal with doing the ritual at all i mean that that was his message there and it took a couple hundred years before that course was changed i think it's such a pertinent verse when we think about uh, uh what to do in this time of turmoil um you know and uh with in the nation and getting back to some simple principles here um uh, in our faith, uh, simple principles in dealing one with another, uh, acting justly, loving mercy, uh, walking humbly. Uh, I think these are, are very helpful verses, uh, a very helpful verse uh, uh, right now um, as we think about uh, racial inequality and dialoguing uh, as a nation. I'm going to read Micah 7, 18 through 20, since these are the last verses. And then we'll try and bring this in for conclusion. Who is a God like you, pardoning iniquity and passing over transgression for the remnant of his inheritance? He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in steadfast love. He will again have compassion on us. He will tread our iniquities underfoot. He will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. You will show faithfulness to Jacob and steadfast love to Abraham as you have sworn to our fathers from the days of old. And with that, the book of Micah comes to conclusion, which uh, I think is an interesting concluding uh, uh, um, section there. After the harshness and uh, the um, expectation of judgment so that the hard-hearted may, may not even be able to repent, we still end up with a loving and ca compassionate Lord who is uh, passing over transgression and uh, not retaining his anger uh, forever. I'll bring this then in for conclusion. Judgment is harsh. Judgment is repeated in, in Micah. And it makes sense when we've broken the covenant and we keep pl placing uh, idols on the high places and uh, ignoring uh, the cries of uh, people within the land, it, uh, it makes sense why there'd be judgment. And repeated hardness is a really, really big problem uh, for the Lord might not be gracious in the future. But God's love and his kindness to his people is repentant. A remnant of his people will always exist. And in the light of uh, judgment and his coming, the key idea is do justly, love mercy, walk humbly uh, with our God um, uh, makes a lot of sense. Final comments or thoughts, uh, Bill or David? One question uh, on there, not a comment. You were at a couple of the slides, you had a picture, uh, and it was looked like some icons. Was that supposed to be an icon of Micah? I believe so. Maybe I have the wrong one. Sometimes they all look the same. Well, I was just saying, I've never seen any of the prophets in any of the icons, so. 
I was going to say, and you, you can't tell. I was, I'm looking at the lettering. And I can't. Uh, I can't see whether it's really letters or uh, whether that's supposed to be Hebrew. Um, yeah. But I just wondered because I haven't seen a uh, a uh, you know a prophet as a uh, icon in. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I can't think of uh, icons as prophets. So anyway, you yeah. know. Any thought, David? Final thought you want to have? I just think that, um, you know, the, the, the prophets, and especially the minor prophets, uh, you know, appeared to be uh, obscure to the average Bible reader, um, but they're very relevant, and um, they, uh, they teach us much if we're uh, willing to open ourselves up to it. And that, you know, that, that Micah 6.8 is a verse that's uh, been put in, you know, to music. Yep. Um, and it, I, I also think that it's man's, man is predisposed to religion. Um, but God, um, you know, through, through uh, Christ's teachings, uh, Christ's sermons, uh, also through the sermons of John the Baptist, God strikes at the heart. Yeah. Well, Mike, it's not a book that I open up uh, that frequently, but um, I was struck this time by uh, uh, just the, the, the whole parameters of uh, messianic uh, expectation, remnant, uh, promise, but also judgment and um, uh, almost final judgment uh, in, some, in, in some places. Um, it was an interesting book uh, uh, to work with and uh, as we move um, you know, shortly to uh, take this podcast on uh, racism and reconciliation, and I'm uh, thinking in terms of uh, I'm thinking about uh, uh, the worries of a hardness of heart to uh, to racism um, uh, in our land. Um, yet the uh, continued uh, calling of God's people to repent uh, and to turn to Him, and then also the hope that. Um, uh, is ours in the future uh, through the Messiah, not through another means. And yet in the meantime, uh, to do justly, uh, love mercy and walk humbly with uh, our God, I, I think, I think is, is, is helpful, at least it's helpful guidance for me.